According to our tradition, I would like to open this academic ceremony with a prayer. Spiritus Sancti Gratia, Illuminat Sensus et Corda Nostra. Please be seated. On behalf of uh, Radboud University and Radboud University Medical Center, I wish you a very warm welcome to the inaugural lecture of Professor Corina Greven, who has been appointed in 2021 as full professor in environmental sensitivity in health. A special welcome to the parents and uh, the brother and the cousins of uh, Professor Greven, as well as Professor Renner, who is vice president of the German Psychological Society, and also a very warm welcome to the friends and colleagues of Professor Greven. My name is Jan Smit. I am Dean of the Faculty of Medical Sciences and also acting rector for this ceremony. Corina Greven was born in Nuremberg in uh, Germany. She studied psychology in Bamberg and completed her Bachelor in Psychology at the University College in uh, London, followed by a Master in Social, Genetic and Developmental Psychiatry. In 2011, she received her PhD at the same institution with the highest possible grade. In 2012, she became postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Cognitive Neuroscience here at Radboud UMC and the Donders Institute for Brain, Cognition and Behavior, and at the Academic uh, Center for Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, um, Character. Professor Greven focuses on studying the differences in sensitivity to environmental stimuli. An important question is how heightened sensitivity to negative and positive environments impacts our health and contributes to positive health, but also to uh, so-called disorders, like autism spectrum disorder and sensory processing sensitivity, also known as high sensitivity disorder. Professor Geven, the floor is yours and we are eager to hear your lecture. Thank you very much. Dear Rector Magnificus, dear colleagues, dear friends and family, it is my great pleasure to stand here today to give my inaugural lecture. I would like to start this speech with a question, and it is a question to you here on the corona, those in the audience, and those watching online. The question is, what do you think of when hearing the term high sensitivity? Think maybe of a coworker or yourself being called highly sensitive. Please raise your hand now if you think it's a negative thing to call somebody highly sensitive. Who thinks it's a negative thing to call somebody a highly sensitive person? I see some shows of hands and more on the corona. <laughs> Please raise your hand if you think it's a positive to call a person highly sensitive. I see more shows of hand here. Well, while this is a selected and probably positively influenced audience, in everyday language, high sensitivity has an image problem. The term is commonly used to describe different manifestations of vulnerability in which a person is easily hurt or offended. The predominant connotation is of someone who is, cries easily, is female, or simply can't take a joke. It's typically something you do not want to be, too sensitive. Well, I'm here today to tell you that this notion from everyday language has been outdated by science. The overall message that I want to pass on to you today is that high sensitivity does indeed come at a cost, but also with major benefits that largely remain to be leveraged in our society. By neglecting high sensitivity, we spoil people's talents, we spoil their well-being, and we spoil their personal effectiveness. Unfortunately, this is not always recognized at this point in time. Today, I would like to invite you on a journey with me to rethink sensitivity to environments. 
I would like to get you sensitive to sensitivity. And I will do so in five parts. I will first give an introduction, then show theoretical models on environmental sensitivity, focus on empirical findings on high sensitive personality, say a few words about my own background in ADHD research, and I will end with future directions. What does a single cell organism, such as an amoeba, have to do with sensitivity? What does a single cell organism, such as an amoeba, have to do with sensitivity? Well, of course, even such a basic organism has to be sensitive to molecules in its environment. For example, an amoeba can say it sends lights and chemicals and move towards or away from them. A basic sensitivity is a feature that's shared by all living organisms. At a fundamental level, sensitivity refers to aspects of perception and internal processing of environmental stimuli. Sensitivity is not the same as responsivity, but often results in psychological, behavioral, or physiological consequences. Of course, humans are not amoebas, and we have developed sensory organs and highly evolved brain in order to perceive and process stimuli. This allows us to be sensitive to social, emotional, and cognitive stimuli, as well as external ones, those emerging from outside us, and internal ones, those emerging from within us. Think of hunger or pain or internal thoughts. Sensitivity is also essential to all forms of human communication, interaction, and culture. For example, clinicians here at the Radboud University Medical Center need to be attuned to, to their patients' emotions and needs in order to build trust and connection. If humans were not sensitive to nuances in acoustics and visual details, there would also be no arts, no music. Some of the most beautiful arts in the Netherlands would not have been created. It is therefore impossible to think of a topic in nature and society where sensitivity does not play a role. My first key message is therefore, sensitivity is fundamental and ubiquitous, found everywhere. While we are all sensitive to environments, we vary in the extent to which we are. Take the example of this fictional character, Renee. Rene is 12 years old. He's a highly sensitive person, abbreviated HSP. This is a trait characterized by being more sensitive to environmental stimuli than most people. Rene's sensitivity brings him many qualities. He's able to understand and relate to his friends' feelings, notices when they get upset, and knows how to console them. As a result, he has many friends. Small things can make Rene intensely happy, even just something simple like a breeze going through his hair or listening to his favorite pop band. Rene thinks about things deeply. His teacher comments that ins his insights are wise for his age. He's intuitive and creative. However, experiencing things so deeply also has downsides. He's sensitive to negative contents on TV. Unlike his peers, he does not like to watch Harry Potter. The Dementors, dark creatures that steal souls, are way too scary. Not everybody around him understands that. After playing video games with friends, he needs downtime. Otherwise, he gets fatigued and ang angry. Too much sensory input. This is just one example of a trait describing people who are more sensitive to environments than others. But there are many more examples. Concepts described that describe inter-individual differences in sensitivity to environment are found across multiple domains in psychological science, including personality, temperament, psychiatric, social, cognitive, affective, physiologic, genetic, and neurobiological research. There are many examples. You can see them here, and I will not read them all out, but this list here is extensive and is by far not comprehensive. My key message, too, is therefore we differ in the extent to which we are sensitive to environments. It is clear now that there's no one definition of sensitivity. Rather, there remains conceptual ambiguity. Therefore, rather than providing a definition, I provide to 
aimed to provide an explication of sensitivity, whereas a strict definition closes door and limits, an explication is an act of opening and unfolding. An explication fills the gap of the explicandum, the everyday informal notion of high sensitivity that we saw by means of the explicatum, a precise formal notion in a systematic context. Today, I will put a spotlight on the explication of sensitivity with a focus on high sensitive personality, HSP. There are concepts and there are data, and as I said, there's conceptual ambiguity around sensitivity. For one cannot dispel conceptual confusions by experimental methods, I will start with introducing theoretical concepts before describing empirical findings later on. So the following I'm gonna say is not about HSP per se, but aims at a broader view. Probably the most famous model of environmental sensitivity is that of diacy stress. This is a model that explains, that aims to explain why some people develop psychopathology, mental health disorders or symptoms of them when faced with environmental stresses, whereas other people remain resilient. This is, of course, a very topical question because we do live in times of increased environmental adversity due to war, climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic. So who stays resilient during these times? Explaining the diocese stress model, here on the, in the figure, you can see on the x-axis environments plotted, ranging from negative to positive, and on the y-axis mental health, also ranging from negative to positive. Here, a resilient person is somebody whose mental health is unaffected by negative environments. In contrast, a sensitive person, here called vulnerable, is at increased risk for developing poor mental health when exposed to negative environments. To give an example, we know that vulnerable people are at higher risk for developing depression when exposed to stressful life events such as divorce or job loss, relative to resilient people exposed to the same level of events. Factors making a person vulnerable can be found at many levels that I showed early on, including personality, genetics, cognitive variables. That certain factors make some people more vulnerable to developing mental health problems is incontestable. Evidence for this is really abundant. Mental health problems, in turn, are a major public health concern. In the first half of 2021, for example, 15% of the Dutch population from the age of 12 reported psychological complaints. Although only part of the effects will be environmentally moderated, psychological complaints, in turn, account for 42% of cases of an incapacity for work in the Netherlands. This brings substantial human suffering and productivity losses. My key measure three is therefore, high sensitivity as vulnerability is costly and a public health concern. But luckily, this is not the end of the story. The diocese stress model originated from psychiatry in the 1960s and is biased towards psychopathology. However, in the 1990s, a paradigm shift occurred in how we think about sensitivity to environments. And this is linked to the discovery of differential susceptibility. This is shown in the figure on the right here. In, in this figure, in orange, we again have environment on the x-axis and mental health on the y-axis. But in contrast to diocese stress, those previously described as vulnerable are now called highly susceptible. Highly susceptible people are more likely to show poor mental health when environments are negative, but are also more likely to show particularly good mental health when environments are positive, known as differential susceptibility. To give an example, children with high cardiovascular and immune reactivity have been shown to have the highest respiratory illness rates when exposed to high stress family settings, but the lowest illness rates when exposed to low stress family settings. So in other words, the children with the same cardiovascular and immune 
predisposition could be either among the healthiest or the unhealthiest among their peers, depending on environmental condition. Differential susceptibility, in essence, captures what the Dutch football legend Johan Grauf already knew in the 1970s in his famous quote, El gnadil heb sein vordeo. Every disadvantage has its advantage. The question is then, why did it take scientists so long to figure this out? And the answer is simple. Scientists simply didn't measure it. Instead, scientists only measured the absence of adversity and the absence of psychopathology. And as you can see, if you don't measure the positive spectrum, the pattern that you see in the data looks the same. So differential susceptibility goes undetected. So we really need to measure also the positive side. My key message for is high sensitivity extends to positive environments and benefiting more from them. We can also rethink sensitivity as vantage sensitivity. People who are vantage sensitive, shown in green, are more likely to experience positive health in positive environments, but are not more likely to experience poor mental health in negative environments. In contrast, vantage resistant people are unable to benefit from positive environments. To give an example, children with a high IQ may benefit disproportionately from a high quality education without being disproportionately negatively affected if they get a low quality education. In other words, low sensitivity can also be a problem, maybe even a greater problem as this headline from a Belgium psychiatrist suggests. My key message five is therefore, low sensitivity makes you benefit less from positive environments. What makes a person sensitive then? One perspective suggests that low environmental sensitivity emerging, emerges from having no or few genes predisposing to sensitivity. This is shown here in the top row. Here, environmental exposure doesn't matter it will always lead to low sensitivity if, if there are no or few sensitivity genes. However, in the presence of an initially neutral genetically based propensity for sensitivity, early childhood environments do play a vital role. If environments are adverse, dicey stress will emerge. If they're neutral, differential susceptibility, and if they're supportive, vantage sensitivity. My key message six is therefore, Early life environments may turn an initially neutral genetic predisposition into one bias towards susceptibility to negative or positive environments or both. One last theoretical point. From an evolutionary perspective, high sensitivity is first of all costly because it means putting more time and energy into sampling the environment. Here we can see five gazelles drinking water. And there's one that's highly sensitive and it's, it's looking around. It's therefore slower to drink the water, so it comes with a cost. At the same time, however, it's more likely to notice that predator that's hiding there behind the bushes. So it's less likely to be eaten by the predator and it can warn other, other animals if this predator approaches. Whether a sensitive strategy is successful is thought to be negative frequency dependent. That is, it pays off only if a minority of the population is highly sensitive, roughly 20%. My key measure seven is, high sensitivity comes with evolutionary advantages if a minority, about 20%, is highly sensitive. So far, I have been busy with clarifying theoretical concepts. Concepts are important for um, productive data collection and interpretation of data, but of course, concepts without data are not modern science. I will therefore now present empirical findings on one specific trait, namely high sensitive personality, the trait we encountered earlier in the boy, Rene. What many of you here probably won't know is that this speech falls in the Dutch week of the highly sensitive person. <laughs> Right now, 
There are hundreds of activities organized across the entire country of which this speech is just one. And if I'm really honest, the timing of the speech this week was total coincidence. <laughs> but who knows? Maybe it was meant to be. While HSP is currently receiving much attention from society, this is very much an imbalance with its small evidence base. As this Dutch national, national newspaper provocatively put it, and I was interviewed here together with my colleague Professor Homberg, high sensitive personality is extreme gevoelig and ongelooflijk genegeerd door de wetenschap. HSP is extremely sensitive and unbelievably neglected by science. There are just over 100 peer-reviewed studies on HSP, although scientific interest is now rapidly growing. HSP is surrounded by a number of controversies. For example, is it the same as neuroticism? Is it the same as giftedness? Is it too esoteric? And does it even exist? Controversies always implicate open questions, which is why this professorship is important to answer them. The construct HSP was first described only in 1997 by American psychologist couple, doctor and professor Aaron, whom I now collaborate with. The scientific name for HSP is sensory processing sensitivity, although for simplicity I will simply be talking about HSP today. The HSP concept was derived first of all from literature review, but also from qualitative interviews asking adults what being highly sensitive was like for them. Personally, I believe that one of the reasons why HSP lives so much in society is just because it was derived from conversations that took into account experiences of highly sensitive people themselves. HSP is described by several characteristics. These are being more sensitive to subtle stimuli, a greater emotional response to them, higher empathy, deeper processing of environmental information, with the result of being more over easily overstimulated by this information. And if you like these images, these were made for me working with a highly sensitive il illustrator whom I also reference on my slides. One question that I often get is, is HSP the same as neuroticism? And you may know some neurotic people yourself. These are people who tend to be more irritable, more nervous, more likely to see the glass half empty. HSP does indeed correlate with neuroticism around 0.4, but this actually means that most of the variance in HSP is independent of neuroticism. When highly sensitive people get overstimulated, then they can get irritable and anxious or depressed, which may cause this correlation, but the two are not the same. Another frequently asked question is, how many people are actually highly sensitive? Well, first of all, it's important to note that you can consider HSP to be a normally distributed trait. Roughly speaking, based on statistical modeling, we can say that 20% of people in the general population are HSP, 20% are low sensitive, and most people are average on this trait. So this also means that at least one in five people in this room will be a highly sensitive person, although maybe more. I kind of do expect this to be a biased audience here. And as we saw before, because a minority is HSP around 20%, this suggests that HSP brings evolutionary advantages. So how does HSP emerge? I will only say a few things about this. In a twin study in adolescence, and these are data from the twins early development study that I collaborate with, heritability of HSP was 45%. That means that inter-individual differences in HSP are attributable genetic factors to 45%. The remaining variance, 55%, was attributable to so-called non-shared environments, environments contributing to differences between siblings growing up in the same family. We do not know what precise genes and environments are involved, but we expect it to be many genes and many environments of small effect size. There's also first evidence what a highly sensitive brain might look like. 
functional magnetic resonance imaging studies, which I work with, on with together with colleagues from the Donders Institute, suggest that HSP is associated with greater activity in brain regions in the default mode network, which is active when somebody is not performing a task, for example, while daydreaming or thinking about the past or the future. In addition, regions in the salience network appear more active in HSP. This is a network which directs our attention to stimuli that are emotional or particular salient. All of you are a salient image to me right now. This figure actually comes from our team re science re review um, that I worked on together with international colleagues. And together we hypothesized that activity and connectivity in these networks may underlie the greater depth of processing and emotion reactivity observed in HSB. HSB is linked to lower well-being and mental health and more somatic symptoms. These associations include more stress, anxiety and depressive symptoms, fatigue and phys physical complaints, with small to medium effect sizes. Associations of ADHD with ADHD and autistic traits tend to be small. HSB is actually not a disorder, but it's a personality trait. Yet people high on the trait may be more likely to end up seeking help for mental health or somatic problems, as environmental information can easily get overstimulating. Here the link to stress-related problems appears particularly salient. In a Dutch survey by the knowledge platform hochsensitiv.nl, 57% of HSP adults reported ever having re experienced a burnout relative to a population baseline of only 17% of all Dutch employees. So this is a three times elevated rate. While these survey results were not in a population representative samples and therefore likely overestimate prevalence, they strongly suggest that we should pay more attention to this as scientists. The question then arises, how can we prevent highly sensitive people from developing stress-related problems? The models we saw earlier may help give an answer. HSB has actually been linked to all three models, but predominantly, predominantly to differential susceptibility, meaning highly sensitive people, HSP people, are more affected by negative and positive environments. Here are some examples of positive environments that are shown to matter in HSP. First, highly sensitive children exposed to a high parenting quality are shown to have greater social competence and fewer externalizing problems relative to less sensitive children exposed to the same parenting quality. Second, highly sensitive adults are more likely to experience positive effect, effect after watching uplifting movie clips and show more activation in the major reward centers of the brain when viewing photos of the smiling face of their romantic partner relative to less sensitive adults. Lastly, highly sensitive adolescent girls that are shown here in the bottom line had fewer depressive symptoms after a positive psychology intervention program, even though they did not differ from low sensitive adolescent girls prior to the intervention. You can see here. So HSB may also be linked to greater intervention response. The question is then, why is HSP at population level linked to worse mental health and well-being, given such sensitivity to positive stimuli? One answer may be that, whether HSP or not, we all have an evolutionary conserved tendency to be more affected by bad than good news, known as the negativity bias. Yet, highly sensitive people are thought to process information more deeply, and are more affected by that information than most people. Given that bad is stronger than good, and if, as I showed earlier, early life experiences contribute to shaping habitual response styles to environments, then it may be difficult to re reverse this pattern later on. This means awareness about HSP from an early age is crucial. Right now, however, 
Many people only thought at late in life that they are highly sensitive. In our qualitative study, and this is work together with Professor Bucks and the late Dr. Karndorp, our adult participants only discovered in their 30s that they were HSB, and often only during difficult times such as a burnout or a career switch. When finding out about HSB, it gave them an explanation for the feelings and behaviors, like one participant put it, for him it was like the puzzle pieces fell into place. Participants also reported feeling recognized. It gave them a base to cope with overstimulation and was a starting point to increase well-being. As such, HSP may be an important factor in prevention and human flourishing. HSP develops early in life, it can be measured as young as age 3, may, as I showed earlier, predict enhanced prevention response, and it's also related to positive traits such as empathy and creativity and being able to connect just some examples of soft skills that are considered to become more important in the future. My eighth key message is therefore, in HSP lies significant potential for innovating the ways we use to prevent mental health problems and foster well-being and human flourishing. But rather than hearing all of this out of my mouth, allow me to let a highly sensitive person speak for themselves. In this case, seven times Grammy Award winner Alanis Morissette, who describes herself as HSP. And I got exclusive permission to show this here today. Well, I knew something was up when um, my family was looking at me somewhat strangely. Mm -hmm. And I remember probably about 10 years ago, my father and I were sitting down. I was hosting a show in Canada and he was having a moment and I was crying about something intense for me, um, which he'd gotten used to, I suppose, at that point. He said to me, uh, he said, Alanis, I'm so sorry. We just never really knew what to do with you. We were at a loss. Yeah. Something about that moment and his authentic expression of that to me, it uh, validated a lot of my having felt um, alone in a, in a world where I felt misperceived and misunderstood. And I knew that there were a handful of things that if they were taken into consideration that I would be my best self really consistently. And equally if I were to be in environments where I was shamed for what I now see as talents and, a, and a, a gorgeous trait, frankly. Um, had I been in environments where it had been supported, it would have been a lot easier for me and I wouldn't have felt so shame-ridden. Alanis now enjoys advocating for causes she has found to be of central importance. One is attachment parenting. Also, because like her, her son is highly sensitive, she is deeply interested in parenting sensitive children. Alanis told me that she and her husband Solai know that one key to parenting their son ever is, in Alanis's words, honoring his every feeling and letting him feel it through. Another is preventing his becoming overstimulated. If Alanis and Ever both need downtime, then Solai, not having the trait himself, can readily take over. Teamwork. Well, I can imagine some of you may now be thinking, I'd much rather hear more about from Alanis Morissette than myself, but I'm here to disappoint you. I will actually be saying a few words now about my own academic trajectory. Having studied the neurodevelopmental condition attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, short ADHD, for nearly 15 years, the switch to high sensitive personality has been more recent. I got exposed to the topic of HSP only during my PhD in London. This was through talks on differential susceptibility by my colleague Professor Plus and through reading the bestseller The Highly Sensitive Person by Dr. Aaron. This sparked my interest. Why I care about this topic? 
It is a young field and a research niche, niche with tremendous societal impact potential. Since doing this work, I get approached really a lot from researchers, healthcare professionals and the public alike. Through this, I personally experienced the urgency that is felt by many people regarding more evidence-based information on HSB. At the same time, while studying HSB, links became apparent to ADHD and another neurodevelopmental condition, autism. Talking with highly sensitive people during my research, the question just kept coming up. When is it ADHD, autism, and when HSB? What all of three of them share are sensory sensitivities and being more easily overstimulated. But there are also important differences. To name just two, HSB is linked to inhibition, ADHD to disambition. Autism, autism is related to weak theory of mind, that is the ability to understand other, others' mental states, whereas HSB appears to be linked to being particularly good at theory of mind. Yet, it appears that people, when presenting with psycho psychological symptoms, HSP people with psychological symptoms, may wrongly be referred for an ass assessment of mild ADHD or autism. By mild, I for example mean children with autism with intact language and no learning difficulties. This will still need to be backed up by scientific data, but if this meant that some people with HSP were to be misdiagnosed with mild ADHD or autism, this could explain non-response to intervention for some children. Currently, there's nothing taught about HSP in classical textbooks for healthcare professionals. My key message nine is therefore, education about HSP is needed to avoid incorrect framing of it as ADHD or autism. It is increasingly clear that ease of overstimulation is not just found in HSP, ADHD and autism, but also certain stress-related and somatic conditions. What is unique about my approach is that I study HSP in such a broad transdisciplinary context that allows deepened insight, not possible studying them in isolation. In Nijmegen, I'm of course perfectly embedded to do so. The Radboud University Medical Center has strategic research accents on neurodevelopmental conditions and stress-related disorders, chaired by Professor Franke and Professor Tendelkar, as well as allowing me to connect to clinical departments. Furthermore, Charakter Child and Lesson Psychiatry, where I work, among others, with Professor Stahl and Professor Rommelse, is a nationally leading center on neurodevelopmental conditions in children and a key collaborator in this regard. Some people are saying that we should look at neurode neurodevelopmental conditions, such as ADHD and autism, as differences rather than disorders. This is captured in the term neurodiversity, which emphasizes that all brains are different. ADHD and autism are then simply two examples of brain diversity. In her book, The Divergent Mind, Bay Area author Gennaro Nuremberg advances this idea in two ways. First, she proposes to place HSP among such neurodivergences, as HSP and other personality traits like introversion also reflect brain differences. Second, the author puts forward the notion that people's inner traits, such as HSP, ADHD or autism, should be respected in the same way as outer categories of identification such as race, culture, sexuality expression, and gender. Such an approach may help reduce stigma, as, as I showed earlier, sensitivity is something that all of us possess. My tenth and final key message is therefore, ADHD, autism, and HSP should be considered integral aspects of diversity and inclusion initiatives. Let us go back to our fiction boy, Rene. What I haven't told you yet is that recently, Rene has been less happy than usual. Not seeing his friends during the pandemic has been difficult for him. His love for animals has made him active in animal rights, but he's also deeply worried about the climate crisis. This has made him more somber and withdrawn. His mother is concerned as he's having real difficulties sleeping. 
I therefore ask, how can science help a boy like René make the most of his personal qualities and keep mentally healthy? Well, my first answer is that René will be helped if we have more robust evidence-based information on HSB. This first of all includes improving questionnaires because right now um, we measure HSB mainly with the highly sensitive person and the highly sensitive child scales, but these have serious limitations and that is why I'm working together with researchers in the US, UK, Italy, Germany and the Netherlands on optimizing HSB questionnaire assessment. Further, my group will also be working on new biological and objective tools for measuring and validating HSB. We currently do not know what happens on the pathway from sensory organs to the brain in HSB. Is HSB related to differences in processing at sensory level or to how sensory information is integrated in the brain? Such knowledge will be invaluable for informing interventions for overstimulation, for example, whether they should target sensory or higher levels of interpretation. To this end, I work together with the Nijmegen-based Healthy Brain Cohort, a cross-faculty co collaboration which is collecting longitudinal, cognitive and neuroimaging data from 1,000 healthy adults. I am also collaborating on a large European project called AIMS2 Trials, that collects longitudinal sensory and social cognition data from young children, HSB, autism and ADHD. While biological research is indispensable, you cannot reduce phys psychological to physiological phenomena. We are unable to see, taste or feel what other people experience. Currently, there's no scientific proof that anyone is having an experience except through self-report. A complementary method integral to my professorship is therefore qualitative research, which allows working in a way that is connected to highly sensitive people's everyday experiences and needs. Qualitative research is also one example of how I aim to personalize research. Every man is in a certain respect like all men, like some other men, and like no other man. In other words, while we are all sensitive, some people are more sensitive than others, and every individual is different in their own idiosyncratic sensitivity. Our fictional boy Renee's sensitivity will not be the same as that of Alanis Morissette. For example, are all highly sensitive people sensitive to sound and visuals, or is it also possible to be HSB and only sensitive to taste and smell? The Internet of Things, sensors and machine learning are new technologies that will allow the collection of large amounts of data to answer such personalization questions. Methodolo methodology focused scientists at the Donbass Institutes are central collaborators here. Creating evidence-based information is imperative, but it will only help our boy René if it actually reaches his family. To this end, I will work on bringing evidence on HSP to education programs for healthcare professionals, working with both children and adults. Here, I joined forces with training institutes, charities and knowledge platforms. Some of them are here in the audience. As well as linking to health insurance companies and municipalities. I'm also on the program committee of national and international conferences in HSB, together with partners from companies. HSD also needs to be brought into schools and links to giftedness studies. I work with experts in education from Radboud University and the Fontest University of Applied Sciences here. As a core task, I will of course educate the next generation of scientists about environmental sensitivity by training PhD students, postdocs, as well as teaching on master programs on campus. Raising general awareness among the public as well as coaches will also be critical. My research group will give media interviews and write blogs. The Donders Wonders, the science blog of the Donders Institute is a wonderful example. If you don't know it, maybe check it out. 
Locally, I'm connected to various diversity and inclusion initiatives with the goal to make HSB part of their activities. Lastly, at the Radboud UMC, we also have a HSB working group consisting of Radboud UMC colleagues who are themselves highly sensitive. Together, we aim to develop and apply a systematic approach to use the potential of highly sensitive staff members in a constructive way for the Radboud UMC. As a concluding point, Rene will only be helped if science is translated into applied tools. To this end, I plan to study mindfulness-based intervention as a potential strategy to prevent and reduce overstimulation, as mindfulness has at its core how people deal with environmental stimuli. The Radboud Center for Mindfulness is a principal collaborator here. Lastly, Right now, highly sensitive people often only come to our attention when developing psychological symptoms, which may contribute to the negative image of high sensitivity. That's maybe held here in the corona. I therefore plan to study HSB in people who are well-adjusted and successful to inform interventions based on factors that keep highly sensitive people happy and effective. As I showed earlier, we also have to measure the positive side. So high sensitivity is here, and it is here to stay. For a long time, we have ignored the topic, but now it's time to wake up to it. If we don't, chances are missed and talent spoiled. With this professorship, I will make a contribution to an evidence-based approach to high sensitivity. So I said at the beginning, that I want to get you sensitive to sensitivity. So my question to you now is, did I get you sensitive to sensitivity? <laughs> then please join me in this quest. I have a few more words to say. This brings me to the acknowledgements. You maybe noticed that I only mentioned a few names during my speech. In fact, I tried to mention as few names as possible. And that's not because there are so few to thank, but because there are so many to thank. I'm extremely grateful to everyone who is here today and those watching online. Your presence interest and support really mean a lot, like really, really mean a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Yet, you will hear me mention a few names, those who have been formally involved on my academic trajectory, as well as friends and family who especially came to Nijmegen today. First of all, I would like to thank the executive board and the board of directors of the Radboud University Medical Center and the Radboud University for the confidence in my work. I also like to thank the Dean, Professor Schmidt, my head of department, Professor Fernandes, the director of the Donders Institute, Professor Franke, and the board of director, directors of Charakter, as well as the members of the Charakter Academy. Dear Corona Committee, all of you have been very important on my way here. I thank my bachelor supervisors, Professor Renner, Professor Furnham and Professor Chamorro Premusic, who are watching online, uh, the last two, for believing in me early on. It is through your teaching that I got inspired to study personality. I would like to thank my PhD supervisor, Professor Plowman, also online, for his generosity and opening so many doors for me. Thank you, Professor Asherson, for teaching me about ADHD. Professor Homberg, you did. <laughs> you have been very important for me to gemeenschappelijk het HSP onderzoek op gang te krijgen. Thank you for Thank for the mooie samenwerking. Professor Bautela, Jan, 
Je hebt enorm veel invloed gehad op mijn loopbaantraject en ook op mijn leven door mij als startend postdoc naar Nijmegen te halen. Je begeleidde me, maar je liet me ook vrij, zodat ik mijn eigen academische weg kon vinden. Bedankt voor de taalloze kansen die je me hebt gegeven. I thank you to my students. I also see many here. Thank you for keeping me sharp. Um, it's a big inspiration for me to see you learn and grow. And it is you who keep me connected to what will be important for future generations. I would like to thank my colleagues, friends and family in Germany, the UK, the US, Switzerland, Italy and the Netherlands in my acknowledgements. Thank you to my friends from the Donders Institute and we were just walking last night to Nijmegen and I realized that there is hardly a bar or cafe where we haven't had a party together. <laughs> so thank you also for that. Thank you to my mentors and all those others that were active behind the scenes. Liebe Thomas, liebe Katharina, liebe Stephanie, you have become true friends in Nijmegen to me over the past years. Liebe Miriam, ich erinnere mich noch gut an den Tag, als du im Alter von sechs Jahren zu mir in die Klasse gekommen bist. Du hattest die erste Klasse übersprungen und es dann geschafft, auch noch ein Jahr vor mir das Abitur zu machen. Und ich war sicher keine schlechte Schülerin. Ich schätze es sehr, dich die letzten Jahre als gute Freundin und Abenteuerbegleiterin gefunden zu haben. This brings me to my family. Dear Alexia, dear Nika, you traveled the furthest all the way from the US. Our families may be far apart, but we're always feeling close and our connection is very special. Liebe Rainer, liebe Marion, liebe Veronika, Ihr seid ein bedeutsamer Bestandteil dieser Familie. Es ist nicht selbstverständlich, dass wir so viele Familienurlaube zusammen verbracht haben. Für all die schöne Zeit und Verbindung möchte ich mich recht herzlich bei euch und auch bei Franziska und der weiteren Garos- und Thieme-Familie bedanken. Meine Patentante und Namensgeberin Uta. Wir haben eine besonders enge Verbindung. Leider ist Hans Hinrich nicht mehr bei uns. Der hätte heute bestimmt die besten Witze über mein Outfit gerissen. <lacht> lieber Bastian, liebes Bruderherz, wir sind ein Beispiel dafür, wie Kinder aus der gleichen Familie sehr unterschiedlich sein können. Ich bin sehr froh und dankbar, dass wir die letzten zwei Jahre während der Pandemie als Familie noch näher zusammengewachsen sind. Danke, Danke für deine Unterstützung und Anwesenheit in Tatkraft und Wort. Ich bin sehr stolz, einen Bruder zu haben, der Studienrat ist. Besonders glücklich bin ich auch, dass du in Lisa eine so gute Partnerin und Bereicherung für unsere Familie gefunden hast, auch wenn sie heute aus gutem Grund verhindert ist. Den größten Beitrag zu dieser Rede haben dann aber doch zwei Menschen geleistet. Lieber Papa, liebe Mama, es ist doch nie passiert, dass ihr nicht für mich da wart. Es gibt nichts Wichtigeres, als mich so bedingungslos angenommen und unterstützt zu fühlen, wie ihr es immer getan habt. Dass ich Professor werden würde, war für euch kein Thema. Druck habe ich in dieser Hinsicht nie gefühlt. Aber deswegen seid ihr nicht weniger stolz. There are so many more names that I would like to mention and so many more people to thank, but time is up. I would therefore like to end by saying again, thank you, thank you, thank you to every single one of you. The reception is now waiting and ik heb gezegd.
Thank you very much, Professor Greven, for your uh, very inspiring uh, lecture in which you uh, invite us to leave our negativity bias and not only put attention to the vulnerability and negative aspects of high sensitivity, but to uh, open our eyes to the broad spectrum of sensitivity and also the positive aspects. And uh, I think this is all about uh, resilience and adaptation and diversity, which is very important. And you also discussed with us the importance of the environment. And in my opinion, one of the toxic contributions of an environment can be that we consider that everything is that is not normal is abnormal and I think this also um, paradoxically contributes to the vulnerability of people who are not normal and you told us that one in fifth uh, of this audience may ha be high sensitivity but I'm sure that 100% of this audience is abnormal. <laughs> I think you also invite us as Radboud UMC and Radboud University to be high sensitive high sensitive to the needs of our students, but also high sensitive to the needs of our society to have real impact. And I really uh, admire also your contribution to the invitation to colleagues with high sensitivity traits to help our organization to see things that we cannot see and to feel things that are important. And as such, I think you help us to become more diverse than we were before, which goes far beyond the concept of gender diversity, but uh, diversity in the real meaning of the term. For that, I thank you very much, and I hope that this is the beginning of a very important uh, 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 traject with each other. For now, I think uh, we can invite each other to have uh, drinks and probably to have a party downstairs. and. Uh, uh, before I will invite the Corona to leave the uh, uh, room, I will uh, close this uh, session with a prayer. Gratias tibi archimus, omnipotens deus, pro omnibus beneficis tuis, vivis et regnas per omnia secula seculorum.